Hello everyone and welcome to our series on urban energy modeling with Dragonfly. In this first video that we're covering here, I'm just going to give you a summary of what Dragonfly is and how it fits in, into the Ladybug Tools ecosystem. Uh, and I'm also give a, going to give a summary of what you should know going into this series in order to be able to get the most out of it. Uh, so first and foremost among those points is that before you go and watch this series on urban energy modeling, I really strongly recommend that you know energy modeling workflows with our Honeybee plugin uh, before you go and try and learn the, the larger urban scale workflows that we're going to cover in Dragonfly here. And the reason why I say this is because there are a lot of fundamental concepts that we cover in the Honeybee energy modeling series uh, that I'm going to go very quickly over uh, in this series here. A lot of what we're talking about here is just kind of scaling up a lot of those fundamental concepts we learned in Honeybee to a larger urban scale using Dragonfly. Uh, so that's why I really strongly recommend if you haven't built a lot of Honeybee energy models yourself in the past, I really strongly recommend that you watch our tutorial series on Honeybee energy modeling before you watch this one. And the links to those Honeybee energy modeling videos will be in the description. Uh, we have hours of content on those. Uh, so please, please make sure that you at least have some experience with that before you dive into the, the deep end of urban energy modeling uh, with this series. So. Moving on from there, I kind of wanted to give you guys a summary of how exactly Dragonfly models are structured uh, so that you can get understand sort of how they differ from the Honeybee models that you worked with in previously. So Dragonfly, fundamentally, it's, it's an abstracted way of representing building geometry. It's more, much more abstract than the way Honeybee represents geometry, which is as this detailed 3D model. Uh, and so every Dragonfly model has building geometry represented as a series of 2D floor plates, uh, extruded 2D floor plates, basically, as you see here. And the way that these, these Dragonfly models are built is with this hierarchy of individual room 2Ds that can uh, be joined together into a story, a Dragonfly story object. And then those story objects come together to create a Dragonfly building representation. Uh, so if we were to take this kind of diagram that I have here and, and abstractly express how Dragonfly models are structured, it looks a little bit like this, right? So every Dragonfly model has some buildings. Uh, it can also have context shades that can shade those buildings, and those can represent things like trees uh, or parking garages, maybe things that aren't necessarily uh, participating in the energy calculation, but you still still can block the sun. Uh, and again, those buildings are composed of stories, which are then composed of room 2Ds. Uh, and there's a sort of parent-child object relationship between these, these building elements here. So you basically every room 2D must belong to one and only one story. And the same is true between stories and buildings. Uh, but Dragonfly models are just the containers that can hold any number of buildings. Buildings can belong to any number of models. Um, it's, it's a less of a, it's a loose collect, uh, relationship between these two. Okay. So this is essentially how Dragonfly models are structured. Uh, the next kind of question is, how does this relate to Honeybee? So if you look at Honeybee models using that same type of diagram structure, uh, this is what, a, what a, the way that Honeybee models are, are essentially structured would look something like this. Uh, so right, so the coarsest object you can really work with in Honeybee is a room. Uh, there's no object to represent a story or a building or anything like that. Uh, and that's why it's, well, hun while Honeybee is very good for representing sort of detailed individual buildings, uh, it's really not designed to handle the urban scale that we're doing with Dragonfly. Um, so again, those rooms are composed of even more detailed elements like, like faces that make up the envelope of that building, the volume basically of that, of uh, the room is defined through individual faces. And those faces can host apertures or windows or skylights. Uh, they can host doors and all these objects together host shade. Um, so again, if I wanted to, to try and build an urban model uh, with a hierarchy of stories and buildings and, and, uh, uh, and multiple basically hierarchies of an urban model, I would have to do something like this in order to be able to, to manage all those rooms together. I'd have to you know, maybe group a bunch of rooms into a single list and then make lists of lists right, in order to uh, represent basically the, the number of stories. And then the entire model altogether would have lists of lists of lists. It would just get very, very difficult to manage. I'd have a lot, a lot of nested lists basically in order to represent that hierarchy. So this is fundamentally one of the main reasons why we have Dragonfly, right? So Dragonfly, we actually have, instead of having just lists or arrays to host uh, all these objects, we really have um, objects that specifically represent buildings and stories. Um, and very importantly, every Dragonfly model can be translated into a Honeybee model. 
All right, so there is this translation process that actually happens pretty much any time that you run an energy simulation or, or a radiant simulation for that matter. Uh, we will be translating the dragonfly representation of the model into a detailed honeybee one. Uh, but the beauty of building models with Dragonfly is that you have this layer of abstraction where you can easily manage uh, these, these uh, uh, you know, higher level types of objects uh, without having to get into nitty gritty details. And one thing very important that you'll notice is that the finest level of detail that exists within Dragonfly is just the room. So there are no elements for faces or apertures or, or, or doors. All these get represented in a much simpler manner with a simple set of rules. Uh, uh, and just to give you a kind of legend to basically what we're talking about here, so, uh, and so really, while we still have some, you know, the ability to represent detailed 3D geometry through contact shading Dragonfly, it's really uh, trying to capitalize on this, this uh, the, what we can do in 2D here, basically, to make things much easier to manage. So, basically, what does this mean? So, to summarize the important rules of Dragonfly models that I, I've kind of mentioned over the last minute or two, so all Dragonfly models have building geometries that are composed of extruded 2D floor plates. So again, this is a major limitation. There are certainly many types of uh, curvy roofed buildings that are really not ideal for representing in, the, in the, um, the Dragonfly schema. But when you're working on the urban scale, a lot of the times the vast majority, you know, 90 plus percent of buildings will fall under this assumption of just extruded 2D floor plates. Uh, and so being able to capitalize that on the Dragonfly schema makes it much easier to build these large models. Uh, the other important rule that I covered is that there are no individual window or shade geometries within Dragonfly schema. They are all represented through simple sets of rules. So, right, so there's no actual window geometry object that you can pull out of a Dragonfly model. Instead, you'll find something like, you know, window ratio equals 40%. And that is what gets assigned to your Dragonfly Room 2Ds in order to, to say that, all right, when this model gets translated into, uh, into an energy simulation format, make sure that we have windows that, that uh, respect that, that uh, guideline. Same thing can be said about shades, right? You just have a rule that says, uh, give me an overhang that has a depth of a meter, right? There's no actual overhang object. It's just, uh, it's just a set of rules that get applied to these Room 2Ds. All right, and lastly, uh, one thing that I didn't really mention in the previous slide, but it's in another important rule of how Dragonfly models work, is that the energy properties are assigned with these kind of room, you know, compound level room objects. Uh, so what I mean by that is that instead of being able to assign individual constructions to individual windows or faces, uh, you're instead going to use a construction set, and you'll assign that construction set to the room 2D. Uh, now, we covered construction sets exhaustively under, uh, under the Honeybee Energy Modeling series. Uh, so again, if you haven't watched that yet or if you've never kind of worked with construction sets, uh, please go over to that video series uh, so that you can get a, get a kind of crash course in what construction sets are and how they work. But basically, they'll contain all the logic uh, for how to assign a set of constructions to the walls, roofs, floors, ceilings, windows, etc. Of a, of a room. Uh, so you can assign them to the room 2D, to those, those uh, fine, the finest object that you can work with in Dragonfly. Similarly, you're going to assign all the loads and schedules using program type objects that, uh, that essentially contain all of those things that define how an individual room or space is used. You'll use those in order to, to assign those energy properties to the room 2Ds, the Dragonfly room 2Ds. Uh, and you'll use HVAC templates similar to what we use in Honeybee. Uh, to assign those those HVAC systems uh, to the various components of the of, of your Dragonfly energy models as well. Uh, and so to kind of give a, a visual description of what these limitations kind of sum to, like if we were to take a, a, a kind of detailed BIM model like this and translate it into both Dragonfly and Honeybee, I mean in Honeybee we could get all this representation of detailed windows, you know, really do something that's a high fidelity to the original model. In Dragonfly, again, it's just going to look like a series of extruded floor plates with, you know, say a set of rules like the window ratio is X uh, over these, these uh, each and in, in every individual uh, wall segment that defines those, those room 2D polygons. Uh, so for a building like this, this is not the best type of building to represent with Dragonfly. You know, if you're only building an energy model of, of a single family house like this, uh, Honeybee is going to probably be a much better friend to you than, than trying to use Dragonfly. But again, when we get to, to the urban scale where we're trying to model, you know, several skyscrapers in a district, uh, these, these, it becomes very helpful to represent uh, the, the rooms basically using this, this Dragonfly schema instead of the 
the, you know, having to worry about every individual detailed window that might be in a, mo in a honeybee model. Okay, so to get more to the reasons of exactly why we would want to uh, 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 build a dragonfly model as opposed to a honeybee model, like what are the advantages of using dragonfly as opposed to just building it straight up with honeybee? Uh, I mean, the first one is that we get several streamlined workflows for urban model creation, and we're going to cover all the workflows that I'm about to show you over the course of this tutorial series. Um, but first and foremost, you know, you can create your dragonfly models by creating individual room 2Ds, you know, putting those together into stories, and then putting those stories together into buildings. And honestly, this, this gives you the most control over how exactly your individual dragonfly buildings are zoned uh, and what are the individual uh, different spaces within that within that dragonfly building. Uh, so you can, you know, you can do it this way, which is very, you know, has a high fidelity to how this scheme is actually structured. You can also, though, because everything's just an extruded 2D floor plate, build your models directly from closed solids, closed building massing, like what you see here. Uh, and so I'm going to cover actually how we can, you know, with just a component or two, create an urban urban scale model from the closed volumes that you see uh, in this in this kind of example in the center of the screen here. Uh, right, because it's really just a matter of just intersecting those solids with a few floor plates uh, in order to get the, those 2D uh, uh, stories and then turning those stories into, you know, into dragonfly stories that are then combined into dragonfly buildings. Uh, the other thing is that we have a lot of urban data sets are just building footprints. Um, and it's so it's you can very easily go just from those 2D footprint geometries to an energy model, a dragonfly energy model with with a you know a few components, a handful of components, um, really because it's just a matter again of taking that 2D representation of the footprint and and basically mapping that to the 2D structure of a, of the dragonfly model. Uh, so again, we get all these these three very nice workflows of of you know of assembling dragonfly models depending upon what you guys are starting from uh, or how uh, how further along in the design process you are. Uh, probably at a start, uh, it's very easy to kind of just create uh, buildings from footprints. And in fact, we're going to spend most of this series, uh, uh, you know, just with this workflow of creating buildings from footprints, uh, really because it's the it's the fastest. Uh, and I think it's going to be one of the best ones to really learn the Dragonfly components with. I will probably say that one of the most popular workflows that we find in our community is people who want to build Dragonfly models from the solids. Uh, because they're a very, very common way of, of master planning in very early phases. Uh, so this is a very, very popular one. And, you know, usually when you're then getting to the later stages of actually trying to, you know, specify what exactly is going in each individual building and how much floor area is occupied by each and every space, you know, you can start to convert some of these these models, these simpler models into one that, that use the room to stories to building workflow. Um, so, all right, so that's one advantage is that we get these streamlined uh, workflows for creating urban models. Uh, another advantage that we get is that because everything is basically represented as 2D, we're able to assign multipliers directly to Dragonfly story objects. Uh, and this allows us to easily represent repeated stories over the height of a building. So at one end of the spectrum, let's say I have a building, uh, you know, this is about a 600 room building, 600 zones in, in this thing. Uh, and so I could, if I want to build a model that is this detailed with Dragonfly, because again, everything's an extruded floor plate. But the beauty of Dragonfly is that we can actually just assign multipliers to the stories, you know, only to the, the unique stories that exist within this building. So if I go to the other end of the spectrum, I can export a Dragonfly model into, you know, this, a much, much simpler format if I'm really only just concerned about saying like, all right, these are the three main types of story geometries I have that define my building and they get repeated, you know, four times and then six times and then 10 times up to make the height of this building. Uh, so again, I mean, uh, you can, you essentially now can choose your level of detail because of these, these story multiplier objects. Uh, and so while, a, you know, a model like this may be needed for like, you know, really production level stuff, maybe you really need to look at the individual solar gains in, in the rooms, like in the middle of here, something like this is probably good enough for, you know, just to make some early stage design decisions comparing, let's say, you know, one HVAC template to another. Uh, and the beautiful, the really beautiful thing is because we have these story multiplier objects is that you can also just create, you know, uh, a, a kind of nice common ground in between these two extremes. Uh, so we're going to create a model that's like this over the course of this, this series. 
uh, where essentially we're, we're pulling out the unique stories that are needed to define these, uh, you know, the, the heat loss that you get from the roof surfaces. Uh, but we're still using multipliers basically in these places where we don't really need them. Uh, and that, you know, dramatically changes the amount of time to simulate a building like this would be, you know, uh, <laughs> at least two or three hours. The amount of time to simulate a building like this is is 20 minutes, right? Because we really are uh, removing a lot of the individual details there. And probably you can simulate something like this in in, uh, in 10 minutes, even even quicker than that. So again, you can choose your level of detail because of the, these, uh, the kind of uh, limitations imposed by the Dragonfly schema. All right, let's see. Another thing that, you know, you can easily auto-generate plenums. I kind of showed this in the previous one. Because everything's 2D already, uh, you can decide if you want to, you know, just maybe only model the actual spaces that you care about, or you can auto-generate some geometries from that. And that's easy to do because everything's an extruded floor plate. Also, because everything's an extruded floor plate, we can do things like generating core and perimeter zones very easily. Uh, and we'll definitely cover this, uh, especially within, I think within like the first two videos, you'll see uh, we'll make use of this core perimeter offsetting uh, so we can, you know, uh, model our buildings at least in a way that's uh, uh, sensitive enough to the different orientations and basically separating out each orientation of the building uh, to be a separate zone. So lastly, uh, another one of the advantages, again, I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of 2D uh, urban data sets out there. Probably one of the most common ones is GeoJSON. Uh, and Dragonfly has the ability to both import and export to GeoJSON formats. So you can take a, you know, a kind of detailed 3D model like this, or, or sorry, a massing 3D model like this, and translate that over into a GeoJSON format. Uh, when you, you know, when you have it structured as a Dragonfly model, that's very easy because we know everything, you know, how things are represented in 2D, uh, thanks to the fact that everything is, a, is an extruded floor plate. Uh, so you actually see us do this over the course of, uh, of the workshop. Uh, that will uh, will export our Dragonfly models into a GeoJSON format. And lastly, uh, you know, because we have our models structured, where basically, you know, each story can be its own simulatable unit. Each building is kind of a simulatable unit, right? We have this hierarchy. It becomes very easy to parallelize large energy simulations, large urban scale energy simulations. Uh, and so, in the course of this uh, this this tutorial series, we're going to run our simulations using UrbanOpt. Uh, and you'll see right here, this is a, you know, kind of two second uh, a workflow of sort of how we're going to do this. Uh, but essentially, UrbanOpt is a, um, it is a, an SDK that's maintained by the National Renewable Energy Lab, built and maintained by the National Renewable Energy Lab. And you can see me making use of a lot of CPUs at the end there. Uh, but essentially what we're going to do, we'll, we're going to take our Dragonfly models and export them into a GeoJSON format that can be consumed by UrbanOpt. Uh, so that we can then run, it, UrbanOpt will automatically run each building on its own separate CPU so that we can, you know, actually get results within a timely manner uh, of this of this tutorial series. So, and that's really only possible because the model is structured, you know, with these building objects that are separate from, uh, you know, separated from each other and can each go to their own Energy Plus, OpenCU Energy Plus model when we run things this way. So, because we have our models structured like this, because Dragonfly models are structured in this way, this is what allows us to get uh, images like what you see here and results like what you see here. So, for this urban model that had, you know, uh, over a thousand really, uh, you know, individual rooms uh, associated with it. We're able to run this in a, you know, instead of having to wait days, which is what you'd have to do if all of this were in a single Energy Plus or Open Studio model, uh, you're actually able to run something like this with, you know, in an hour, under an hour, and be able to get results that can give you feedback on the design uh, of, of master plans like this or large urban districts like this. Uh, and again, you know, you can even yeah, because we'll be working with this in Grasshopper, you can do things like scrolling through the results and slicing it uh, and all the fun stuff that you can do with the scripting interface, like what you see here, where we're scrolling through the months of the year uh, to see, you know, which buildings are in heating and which are cooling. If there's any, you know, simultaneous heating cooling maybe that we can use. So hopefully this gets you excited. This gives you a sense of what we're going to be covering in this uh, workshop series. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to end this one and I'll hopefully see you in the next video.